Uh, good evening and welcome to tonight's emergency services meeting. My name is Gary Bell. I'm the chairman uh, of the committee. Um, with us tonight, I'll introduce our, uh, our board. Um, all the way to my right, you have Hattie Norris, our vice chair of the emergency services board. Uh, J.A. Nelson, our fire board president. Uh, C.P. Budinsky, our St. Mary's County fire chief. Uh, to my left, uh, we have Sean Davidson, our county rescue chief. Uh, to his left, we have uh, our new uh, director of emergency services, Jennifer Utz, and Ken Hicks, our rescue squad association president. Uh, with that, we'll move into our meeting, um, and we'll look to the uh, review and approval of, meet of the uh, minutes. Move to approve, posted. Second. I have a motion by Sean and second by Ken to um, approve the minutes from our last meeting. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any against? So ordered. Um, with that, we'll move into our um, EMS study. Who was doing that? Richard. Um, so <laughs> this is uh, Rick Harrison from Mission Critical Partners, um, who was the lead on our study. He did all of our interviews, and not all of them, but most of them. Um, and uh, he did the presentation for the commissioners, and he was at the Hamilton Rescue Squad Association last week. Thanks, Sean. Sure. And good evening, everybody. Thank you for inviting me tonight to uh, go over the highlights of the report. Um, obviously, the, the report's a little bit uh, larger than this slide deck's going to be, but uh, this is the exact same slide deck uh, that um, I presented in front of the commissioners. So I wanted to uh, present the same thing, and, and maybe this will bore some of you, because that was a... Uh, uh, recorded session, so maybe you watch that, but uh, I did want to go over it with you uh, so that you're uh, uh, understanding of what was put in the report, but um, hopefully you'll get a chance to read the entire report, but uh, thanks for having me tonight. Next slide, please. So the scope of the project, and, and this, this was a project by the county, uh, and I want to say I want to thank all the rescue squads uh, for their uh, participation with us and, and their uh, meeting with us when we asked them and they're uh, uh, giving us the information that they, I mean, we got a lot of information from some and, and others we didn't get a lot of, so we had to go digging a little bit, but that's okay. Um, I know there was some trepidation uh, from the rescue squads on this report and, and what was it all about. Um, there was, you know, they thought there was some lack of communication up front as to what this was all about. This was a report for the county, though. This was nothing against the rescue squads. Obviously, there's stuff in the reports about the squads, but it was a report for the county for the future, uh, and that's in quote, in case situation for the future. Um, so it was a manpower study, uh, staffing study, current and projected. Uh, it was a facilities and station uh, recommendation study, and we'll talk about that a little bit. There was some apparatus involved in that and, and units. Um, some financial analysis uh, and the, the current billing methodology. Next slide, please. So with, with that said, the meeting, we did meet with everybody uh, and you'll see on the, uh, the slide deck that when those meetings took place with the rescue squads, uh, Jim Pottinger, a uh, former uh, battalion chief in Baltimore City was uh, my partner. He did some of them, I did some of them. Uh, and then I came back down and, uh, and Jim met with, we met with uh, Gerald and then uh, we met with uh, Tom Raley and uh, the county administration. Uh, we met with uh, Dave Weisskopf, Dave Yingling and Buffy, the uh, legal for the county. And you see those dates um, that we met with them. Next slide, please. So the first thing I told the commissioners was this map, and, and you know, I was very, um, very pleased when we did this map. Um, and I told the commissioners that th this is a uh, six mile road mile from stations, from rescue squad stations. Um, we equate that to about a 10 minute response time, uh, a six road mile time uh, travel. Uh, and that is dispatch, shoot time, you know, getting out the door, uh, getting on the scene, getting patient contact. So we, we, when we run these, we run these for any county. We, we do a, uh, uh, you know, a 10-minute on scene, 
Uh, we, we'd like to get a unit there within 10, as, as some standards are. Uh, and this is a six road mile map. Uh, and as you can see, uh, it is well covered in this county uh, from the station locations. Um, I do a lot of these in other areas, and there's a lot of blotches of openness on a lot of counties. Uh, your county, uh, your station locations are, are really good. Um, we have a little bit in the northwest there that, that's, that's a little open. Um, but as far as most of the county, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that the, the coverage is, is ample and, uh, and really good, really good. So I uh, yes. Quick question, if that's okay. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Sir. So, is there a recommendation for um, additional stations per coverage, or? Well, I, I did not recommend to the commissioners okay. for a, an additional station. Obviously, um, I would like to see Seventh District, about two miles north of where they're at. You know, uh, <laughs> because it would put them into that sweet spot of that coverage area, Buds Creek, and and that. I, I forget the name of the development. There's a development on the peninsula out there that's pretty popular. What kind of good shores? You know shores. what I mean. But uh, yeah. yeah, they're a little south in their zone. Uh, I, I would like to see them nor more north in their zone. Uh, that would take care of that. Um, that is really the only area. I did not recommend that because, you know, it, it's. But if there ever was any thought of movement, I would say move that north. Thanks. That would cover that that hole, what we deem that hole. Otherwise, sir, there is nothing else other than a few, uh, you know, art arteries of roads that go out a little bit, you know, that just aren't covered and, uh, you know, and economics wise, uh, it wouldn't be, you know, I'm not gonna say those people don't deserve coverage, they certainly do, but mm -hmm. you know what sure. I mean, it's just, it's just a few roads out there. Well, the, the thing that you can see with this is, and, and knowing where we're actually running the calls it it's the 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 real hole really is that chaptico hole right that, that you're looking at that's the correct. places where it looks like there's holes um volume is low enough that i think citizens in those areas wouldn't necessarily feel like they're not getting service um and you know we all know that you know there's those places where it's six one half dozen the other who's coming to you and so. Yeah, this is certainly, thank you, Sean. This is certainly a first do map. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously mutual aid or coverage, you know, it, it would grow. And some of these roads that aren't covered, you know, if we ran it another mile, they'd be covered or another minute, you know, it, it would be covered. So there, there's some, but that Chapico area is, is a hole in, in, to some degree. And you'll see on the next slide, if we can go to the next slide. I mean, this is the call volume. Um, for 2022, we could geolocate about 82% of the calls onto the map. Um, and, and you guys know, I'm, I'm speaking to the choir here. I mean, you know where the call volume is. Obviously, you're see, seeing it down three notch and down into Lexington Park, Mechanicsville. Um, but you, you, you do see some calls in that area I'm alluding to up there, in, you know, in the Bud's Creek and, and that other area, Chaptico area. So, um, but for the most part, you see where the call volume is and you know where the call volume is. Next slide, please. So we ran the uh, call volume hour of the day. Um, again, probably nothing new to you folks. Um, you know, we, we start to see, you know, a pretty good uptick around 0800. Um, and then it continues on, obviously, at rush hour at 17. You have your highest call volume. And then it starts to, to recede a little bit. And, you know, by about 21, 2200, it goes back to um, lower call volume. So that, that plays in importance to some of what I'm going to talk about in a little while here. Next slide, please. So the commissioners did want to uh, see the membership numbers, uh, you know, and, and talk a little bit about the membership of the organizations. And, and we, you know, we got that directly from the organizations. And, and uh, one of our questions was active membership. And obviously, I, I came from a volunteer system. I know what active and membership roles are. You know, membership roles are... You know, anybody that pays their five bucks and joins the association, and then you have your people that do all the work and run all the calls. And um, that is where we are seeing, you know, as you see the numbers here, um, and, and the report says it, you know, there is some concern 
uh, with some of the active member roles here uh, due to the fact that you know you're down into the 18 20 25 range um, that's a lot of work for a few people and uh, you know it, it's a burnout factor as, as I'm well aware of being you know former chief of an agency and having to worry about you know who's around during during different times and whether I'm going to get a piece on the street. So, I mean, uh, you know, it was said in the report, and I said it to the commissioners. It is of some concern. Um, uh, the more years that go on with 18 people handling all the duties, you start to lose 18 those 18 people. So when we say active, I'm assuming those are the people that are actually, actually running costs. the ambulance, the in the seats. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you know, it's a concern. And, and you know that's all it was being shown as a concern. Um, certainly, there's there's no red flag going up right now, other than the fact that some of those numbers are a little uh, lean. Next slide, please. So we did a missed calls or no response, and I want I want to say that this is no matter of a uh, career crew in the seats or a volunteer crew. The missed calls is the combination of either. So it's it's not just. The volunteer side missing calls. This is a uh, melted table, but you can see that there's uh, that percentage of missed calls um, and the uh, missed calls in general, the total. So, again, that's a, um, you know, eh, 20%. We're getting up there a little bit. Lexington Park does, does do volume, and, and certainly that's somewhat understandable. Others are doing very well, you know, with a 1% missed rate, that's, you know, it's fine. Do we? So my question is, so is this just the volunteer? No. No, no, so no. It includes the, the... It was everybody. In 22, I'm sorry. In 22, we were under con under the contract, but... So it includes under, both. Yeah. The, the, okay. um, and just one of the things that we talked about uh, at the association, the, the way Rick got handed the numbers, um, it, it makes the... Lexington Park numbers a little inflated. There's about three thousand extra calls in that. Yeah, there is. Um, because the way he, the way they were given the data, the the um, the places where both stations were dispatched on a single call were caught in that data. So it's not a direct comparison to what the rest of the departments are doing. So there, there's there's a, there's fat of about three thousand calls um, in that number, and that I would that skews all that been an improvement from 22 to 20 to now would would you yes. assume that it, not assume we know I mean, there's there's of, numbers yeah uh, like last last, last month, month in the last park, month was, the park ran 599 calls with a six percent dnr 5.84 yeah. percent yeah. dnr rate i guess my my combination yeah. my question would be out of these numbers how many is career staff and how many is volunteer did we have that broke down it, it wasn't parsed out in the in the data okay. um, and uh, honestly it, it probably we could have um, but it doesn't matter because what we're looking at is what's the what is what is the citizen getting and that was the whole point behind this exercise was yeah you know what what, what showing up at your house nobody no no honest, yeah. but it gives us an idea where we yeah plan for in the future yeah right now last month in the park I out of the 599 calls the park the volunteers covered 25% of the call volume and the career staff covered 75% of the call volume. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm sorry we didn't have that broken down. I tried to to attempt that. It's the way the cat, the legacy cat, and I'm not picking on Kirsten here at all. <laughs> uh, yeah, the cat was, you know, for some calls, it had a, a multitude of rigs on it because they were being covered. It was just very difficult. The to gerbils parse. in the 30 year old CAD couldn't yeah, come it, up with it, the it, data. Very <laughs> difficult to parse out. I, I, I appreciate the question, though, because we would like to do mm -hmm. done that, but um, could not. Next slide, please. So as far as the financial, I, I mean, we picked these up off the uh, either the agencies gave this to them or gave us to us or we picked them up off uh, public uh, information. But uh, basically, it's the uh, income uh, and then the expenditures. And what I did tell the commissioners, mo most of these balance, the budget's balanced. And, and I did put some asterisks there for capital expenditure and debt service was involved in some of those. Uh, but as you can see, they're very close to uh, to the income, so it's 
you know, not like anybody's just piling money in their bank accounts. There's, there's expenditures to be made and uh, debt service to pay off. So that's what was provided. Next slide, please. So today, I, I, this slide was uh, total number of transport units today, and that's not on the street at one time. That's just rigs sitting in stations. Uh, uh, vehicles needed for daily operations, uh, we, we you know, said 11 to 12 for daily, not for, for certainly for surge. We put the four extra, and we, we have the two ALS chase trucks. And, and the reason we have the transport up a little bit is we'll explain that here as we go as to what our recommendations are. Next slide, please. So this table, the current state you'll see for the DES is up in the top left. Um, the table to the right is a fully representation of DES at all stations, 24 by 7, in a four platoon uh, break, breakout. Uh, and that would be if, worst case scenario, this is what you would need to cover the um, DES portion of a 24 by 7 operation. Um, you'll see that at Lexington Park and Mechanicsville, we have paramedics. Uh, one of our recommendations is to put medic ambulances in those stations, um, along with, you know, the BLS that's still there, and run a medic ambulance out of the busiest stations that you have. Uh, it would relieve some of the call volume on those other units. It would relieve the chase trucks running around the county. Uh, you wouldn't need a chase truck chasing a medic ambulance. They could handle it. You know, so basically our recommendation is, and then I showed you the call volume prior, you at least have a 12 hour, you know, 0800 to 200 or 1000 to 2200 or whatever you want to run it, at least pilot that uh, at, at a 12 hour shift, uh, a medic ambulance and, and see how that plays out for you. But uh, uh, we feel that a hybrid system here between paramedic ambulances, BLS, and chase trucks would be the, um, our recommendation. Next slide, please. This is just a, a slide to show the commissioner's costs. Um, I, I've, been, I've been told I'm low on this, and I probably am. Uh, vehicle costs are probably over 300,000, probably more 350 onto 400 now, the way things are going. Uh, equipment costs could be a little higher too. This, this is certainly could be an 850 to $1 million thing here if, if uh, that is to start up a unit from ground up. And all that showing them was the cost of EMS. Next slide, please. So our key findings and some of the things uh, were that uh, ensure there's enough staff hired to meet the recommendations for the report. Uh, with the additional transport units that I just mentioned, the medic ambulances, namely the paramedics, uh, to meet that need. Uh, compensation, uh, we, we feel there needs to be a career ladder within DES. Um, their retention, you know, of, of personnel, um, really they should see some sort of career ladder when they come in the door, or you're going to lose them to someplace else. They are. They already are, yeah. So, you know, we felt, you know, we gave a couple of recommendations, you know, paramedic levels, uh, you know, whether that's tenure, whether that's credentialing, extra training that they got, you know, there's has to, some level where they can see downstream that, hey, I can go from a paramedic one to a paramedic two or a paramedic three or a specialist or whatever you want to call it. But there's some career ladder within the department that, hey, if I stay here another year, I'm going to get another you know, stipping the money, another 5%, another whatever. Whatever it is, I've seen it work in whether it's communications, law enforcement, EMS. I've seen it work where a lot of people are goal-oriented and they want to see a goal. And if they don't see a goal, well, why not go up the street and make, you know, make more coin? Um, I think the county should create a pay grade system for DES. Um, they're trying to stick a square peg in a round hole by 
you know, taking a paramedic or an EMT and saying, oh, they're just like this over here. There's a, they, they look at the county system and where can we stick those people? Well, we'll, we'll stick an EMT with the, uh, you know, with the administration or administrative assistant thing. It's, it's, it's the same thing communications did for a long time. You know, they're trying to make a dispatcher a administrative assistant. You know, it's not the same job. And EMTs are not the same job as something in the county, and a paramedic is certainly not the same job. We feel there should be a pay grade system specifically set aside for uh, the DES EMS department. Um, consider a sign on bonus, you know, uh, just for recruitment um, and, and some retention to that too. You can have a sign on bonus that requires some retention in that sign on bonus. You just can't come in the door and quit the next day. There's, a, there's some retention there. But the sheriffs and communications already have it, so uh, why not allow the EMS to have it too? Um, DES facility, uh, we feel the department's large. Well, it is large. It's getting large. And uh, we feel there should be its own facility. Um, now, we did a five-year plan. You'll see that on a couple slides coming up. But uh, we're not saying they have to build a, a facility uh, next year. But, you know, really feel that uh, whether it's a build from ground up, whether it's a lease, um, you know, there should be a EMS DES EMS facility in the county. Uh, the department is is getting large. There's a lot of uh, um, you know office uh, things that need done, and office space is at a premium. There's other uh, garages, um, you know, garage space and storage of EMS supplies. Um, as mentioned, additional units uh, change the you know response method to uh, medic ambulance concept in the busiest areas of the county. And uh, obviously, continued growth and tourism in the area will push push some of these forward. Next slide, please. So what we had here was the five year um, plan. Um, I'd like to see some more roles within the DES department that would handle some scheduling, quartermaster duties, training, uh, a volu volunteer liaison, and building help. Um, they're a little thin. Their lieutenants are doing a lot. Um, uh, they're, they're taking on more roles than what I, I talked to somebody today that's putting in way too many hours for a human being to work. Um, it, it's craziness, and, and it's all because of these ancillary duties that they have to do. They're, you know, it's like you got your day job, and, and you know you have have this all these jobs over here too. You got to do. So um, we feel there should be uh, some support staff within uh, DES uh, increased. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, St. Mary's D should pur purchase transport vehicles for use in volunteer stations. I mean, this is a consideration that I brought up to the commissioners. I mean, basically, they're getting large and they don't own a thing, really. I mean, they, they own a few things, but they don't own a lot. Um, they're using the rescue squad vehicles. Um, there's and, and the report shows it. So, you know, there's been some complaints about the usage of those vehicles and, and the misuse of those vehicles in some people's eyes and some accidents and things like that that aren't being reported. And with that said, um, to alleviate that problem is to start thinking about purchasing your own units. Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to say it here now instead of at the Absolutely. end like I did the other Absolutely. night. Um, this, is, this is one of the very few places where I pretty strongly disagree with, I, I, I see that kind of an expense as a wasteful expense. Um, it's we're, we're already spending millions of taxpayer dollars on transport equipment in St. Mary's County. Uh, it just full stop. We're there. Um, we've got 26 of the freaking things and we're not using them all, all the time. Right. So, um, and, and to be perfectly blunt about it, none of the, uh, none of the complaints that people have had about drivers in particular from DES are any different than complaints that I've heard for the last 35 years from volunteers about people who drive the ambulances. It's, the, it's all the exact same stuff. It's just different people to, to complain about. Right. Right. Um, you know, and so there's a, there's a, there's a, I, I think that there's a place here where we need, we need to be asking for an attitude adjustment rather than let's throw more money at a problem. We have, in my opinion, there are much better things to spend money on like our people. Um, I, mean, I appreciate that. I, uh, I, and I, I, concur, I concur. I mean, it's, it's it, um, from being fired, looking in on rescue, but we have 26 units and we're only 
utilizing 11 to 12, I mean, you know, and we want to go out and buy more when we already have some in reserve. Now, yeah. how you work that out, you know, that's not. That's yeah, I, I think, too, like the biggest complaints that I've heard from other chiefs in, in, the, in the organizations is it's not the main thing of using the vehicles. It's the fact that, you know, the squads are paying for the gas, the squads are paying for the supplies, the squads are covering the insurance claims. So, you know, if DES wrecks an ambulance, you know, the bill goes to, you know, Hollywood. It doesn't go to Department of Emergency Services, you know, or something like that. So that, that that's where your complaints were. And instead of buying more units, it's just working out some kind of thing to where the county, you know, compensates the, or the squads for, you know, either insurance coverage or whatever or somehow. help with maintenance or help with maintenance or program. you know there's there's i i just i think there's better ways to spend our money than that no I, and i i appreciate that comment sean nope i i certainly understand that um where was uh, oh as the fil facility uh and i and i was told this was tried before and i told the commissioners this that the centrally located warehouse for for bulk ems purchases i think there is a economics that could be saved here uh, of scale with with a uh, locally instead of everybody siloed buying their own supplies um, but that is if there would be a centrally located uh, facility with a quartermaster somebody that controls all that well and and that was the problem that we ran as you trying to set it up before it wasn't that we actually got it stood up and it failed it was that we there isn't really a feasible place to you know, make that a thing. Right, right. Understood. Um, again, with the facility, the garage facility for the response units, um, you know, it, it, being out in the weather isn't, you know, uh, you know, the greatest thing in the world for any unit, especially with narcotics and things like that on board. You have to keep it at temperature. Um, we have hired two captains or two additional lieutenants to supplement management and be assigned ancillary duties. Again, that, that spins back to the fact that we felt the, the DES was stood up very quickly back in the day, and it's kind of a reverse uh, pyramid. You know, hire a bunch of people, whoops, I'm sorry, hire a bunch of people, and there was nobody to run the people, you know. So we have a, a lot of people, and we have very few chiefs at the top, per se, and, and supervision. So um, that was the, the uh, recommendation there. We d just needs, and that is if, if, you know, if it grows and, and ancillary duties included here, um, you know, additional lieutenants could take on some of those duties that these other people have three or four duties. Now they're back to maybe having two duties each instead of four. Again, DES pay scale restructuring, uh, as I mentioned. Next slide, please. Uh, established part-time minimum shift requirements. Uh, one of the complaints we did hear from the rescue squad associations was the part-time staff at DES. Um, they feel the uh, tails wagging the dog. The part-timers call too much, you know, uh, you know, call their shots too much, and there isn't established rules of part-time. Um, we understand that uh, you have to have established part-time rules, and if somebody can't meet those part-time rules, they're not a part-timer anymore. Um, we, we, our recommendation is there should be part-time rules. You'll do so many shifts, you know, and if you don't do them, you're out the door. Now, with that said, you know, you do have that issue of, you know, retention and trying to keep people too, and that's where this runs into a little bit of muddiness because of that. Uh, you know, that's why the part-timers probably have a little bit more power than what they should have. But with that said, there should be requirements. There should be shift requirements um, and buy-in from the part-timers. Uh, we, we said for the uh, county DES to join the Rescue Association, be a more of a, we, we heard this kind of loud and clear from the, from the associations that are from the agencies that they want more of a uh, communications and, and uh, you know, somebody to talk to. And, and we did have that as a liaison to the Rescue Association. Uh, again, the sign-on bonus uh, established the medic ambulance response from 29, 38, and 39. We have 39 and 29 kind of right away. If, if everything's successful, 38, not too far behind. Um, and then uh, we facilitate that hire for the paramedics to uh, make that happen. Next slide, please. 
Uh, the top line there is uh, the same as the uh, last line on the other one. Uh, again, bring DES under one roof. Um, this one here, the third bullet here, the, the agency should, uh, could, should consider changing their current disillusion language. Um, I investigated all the, the uh, articles of incorporation and bylaws for every agency, and there is no disillusion language, and I hope it never happens. Please believe me. I, I just looked at it to see, but there's no disillusion disillusion language that states that if a agency goes south and has to dissolve that they can give anything to the county and again as to Sean's point it would be nice that those units could at least be given in the station maybe because otherwise the county would have to build a facility and or find a facility and, and buy units I mean it comes back to that uh, the dissolution language in the Articles of Incorporation for most of the agencies not say, or they can give it to the county. It says they can give it to a, another 501c3, which the county is not. They can give it to uh, another agency, you know, because of that. But there's nothing stating they can just hand over their resources to the county. And when I say just look at it, that's what I mean for agencies just to look at their dissolution language. You know, and I'm not saying if that happens, you have to give them to the county. I'm just saying that there is no option out right now that that would be legal under the disillusion language. Um, and then the uh, EMS billing data collection workflow uh, has to improve. We have it in the report. Um, and, and another thing we heard is, is you know, the agencies would like to see more uh, transparencies in the billing and, and in the report it shows transparencies of the money made uh, uh, from the billing and and you know we see no problem with that being transparent that's that's um, but the workflow of that and, and talking to the one staff member today is you know there's a lot to that and they need uh, certainly to be on top of that to get the most bang for the buck next slide please oh that is the last so within the report, there's a lot more. Um, you know, I hope you read it. Um, you know, I appreciate, you know, Sean's comments. Uh, you know, not everything you have to agree with. Uh, it is what we saw when we were here. And, and I, I do want to say, you know, you guys do a fantastic job. I, I, uh, it was my pleasure to come here and uh, do this report. I uh, enjoyed it. And, um, you know, uh, fantastic job by the associations and the fire departments, too. It's, it's a... Pleasure to be here. Any any questions? I got some questions that probably I'm sure Sean and, and Ken could ask. Do we what's the current uh, labor FY24 labor funding for DES staff? Do what's the current? Do we know that number? What did we? What did it, the, I, it, are you asking? What's the budget for staffing for FY24 for staff for DES? Do, I, do either of you have the wrong guy to ask, right people to ask? Do Gerald, do either of you remember I off the top of your head? I don't remember off the top of my head. Okay. As far as when you say DE staff, so I don't have either number on the top of my head. I can get it. I'd be more than happy to share. I guess my question it. was is how much have we bought in from EMS billing currently uh, for same for EMS billing for this Possibly fiscal year versus same. how much we're paying out in, in labor dollars? So we're nowhere close what we're bringing in versus what, what it's costing us. Correct. Uh, since this started EMS billing, I believe it's around five million that we brought in through billing, uh, and we can get you those numbers. No, I, I just. Um, but again, as Rick and we work very it's good together, but. A lot of time and effort was spent. Um, the billing, we were at roughly 55, 60 percent mm -hmm. of billing, which is great. Yeah, that's um, we know there's some shortfalls. Uh, we've had some very lengthy conversations with MedStar. Uh, there's a meeting, hopefully next week, that will help tremendously in our billing process. Mm -hmm. um, it's huge. Mm -hmm. Still a good statistic, though, 55, yeah. 60 percent. Yes. Yeah. And you kind of answered my question. Has any county county volunteer stations 
EMS stations came to the county to ask them to buy their apparatus or anything prior to or, or has um, that happened? So when the county was looking for the ambulance to fulfill the contract at Charlotte Hall Veterans Home, um, it coincided with, I think it was 59 was replacing an ambulance and they offered to let the county buy it if they wanted it for that. Okay. But then the timing didn't line up properly, and so that didn't happen. Um, the folks at Ridge, um, when they made the decision to reduce their their ambulance load from four back to three again, floated that idea. But the apparatus that they were looking to um, offload was almost 40 years old. So that was... Good. I will say uh, Jack Bailey, the Senator Jack Bailey, had a lot to do with it in the AMLAMPS at Charles Hall Veterans Home. Um, so the state government gave 200000 which did not yeah. nearly cover the cost of that AMLAMPS. Um, but there was a significant did, offset, though. It was a significant offset to that. So uh, that's how we were able to acquire that. And there's another unit that we have that we acquired from Solomon's um, in the very beginning. Yeah. The, like the very, very beginning. Very, very beginning. Uh, I guess my question would be, do we know of any volunteer EMS stations that are replacing, got units coming in in the near future that would be a good opportunity to start the discussion with the county of maybe possibly purchasing those units from that? Short answer is no. Um, and the long answer is that because for most of them, what's happening is trade-in options because it makes it a whole lot easier to to buy something i mean that's the the plan oh, in the park it. um so um i and i don't i wouldn't anticipate that as something that would be doable a, a, a viable path well and in it because let's let's face it what 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 the departments do is they use the things until they don't work anymore you know and that's the reason that that's the reason that you're replacing them um, the, the replacement cycle in the park is the most aggressive one, but it's also the place where they mm -hmm. beat the living hell out of the units most than anybody else. So, um, it's, I, and to be perfectly honest with you, I freaking love three, eight, nine. I spec that thing. I think it's great. There are a lot of people who hate it and <clears throat> I get teased nonstop because of the tramp stamp on the side of the thing, but uh, I didn't pick that part. Um, <laughs> but I, I wouldn't even sell that to the County to be honest with you, just because, it's been road hard and that's that's kind of the 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 story you know sometimes you can you can rehab some of that but not all of it understood i was just looking at the time Report cp uh, helps put a light on the subject and helps us continue those conversations with leadership uh not only with you gentlemen sitting here but the leaderships at the departments um for any opportunities. Yeah. Yep. Uh, well, and there's there's alternatives to to more apparatus that we've that that we've talked about that we smacked around for ages. I mean, we've we've talked about um, getting the department's access to like uh, mechanical support, like the the you know the county shop, like where they do the STS buses and stuff. And like because if we could do if we could do the <coughs> DOT inspections that that everybody does every year for all of their apparatus through the county that's a that would be a huge support of of what we're doing and a cost savings um and and easier to maintain and and all that whatnot so there's just i think there's smarter ways to go about that than than looking at definitely the bulk supply idea that he had <coughs> because i mean the park buys so much stuff and everybody else buys the same stuff and if the county bought it all you get it at a cheaper right. you buy bulk you buy you get cheaper absolutely and well yeah and the the thing the stumbling block again for that has has always been where does it go, where does it go? if we get it because you know look across the street they are packed in their cheek to jowl right i'm actually kind of impressed you got an office of your own ma'am uh, to be honest with you because I, I kind of expected them to make you i kind of expected you, them to make you snuggle with gerald um <laughs> Because every everybody else is everybody else is doubled and tripled up in offices. I can't. We can't have supply orders going to Pettit, who would be the logical person to to facilitate all of that, because there's 
two guys packed into that office now with all the stuff that goes with it and everything else that they do. There's just, there's no place to do it. And, and that, um, you know, it, it highlights a thing that I said to you, I think last week, you know, the, the, the fact that, um, our, the, the management of our EMS division has been tucked into corners I, I don't want to be harsh enough to say as an afterthought, but almost as an afterthought. It's like it's like oh well let's let's find let's find some place where we can put you. So oh hey look here's an empty cafeteria literally. So we're gonna put six people in here with all of your stuff, and you know it's and, and that's where the EMS chief's office is. I can't have a private conversation with the DES EMS chief in his office because there's five other people who work there. So you know and it doesn't need to be like that. There are ways around it. Um, it's just convincing some of the folks who are in decision-making positions to make decisions they don't want to so that we can run an efficient system. Um, and I'm, I'm going to, I actually, th this is proof that Sean's not a politician in any way, shape, or form. Um, I literally sat in front of the commissioners and said, I told you so, when they approved the uh, additional lieutenants because what they've approved in the budget for FY25 is literally what I sat in front of them and recommended to them that they do when we started at the very beginning. Would have been smart at the beginning. So our our infrastructure is three years behind. Yep. Um, and you know it it I, I appreciate that um, what you see is a thing that, and I said this to you too, mm -hmm. stuff I've been saying out loud for the last five years. Um, and it, it's, it, I, I appreciate the, the work that went into that and um, the, the careful consideration, the validation, honestly. Yeah. You know? And again, I, yeah, and I appreciate that, Sean. I mean, I, I look at all you folks, I mean, I'm probably preaching to the choir with three quarters of this report, you know, but it's, it is what it is. It's validation. And, and um, I feel strongly that, you have a good base here and it just needs some tweaking and some yeah. additional things. Well, and I, I, I feel fortunate, honestly, that I, th I think we've got some personalities in place right now that are going to make a lot of the things that we go, that, that, that we need to do a lot easier. Um, it, it's, it's the, um, the, the, the amount of communication and connection that we've had uh, j while we waited for director Rutz to get here, mm -hmm. the, the deputy directors did an incredible amount of work to improve the relationship that existed between our existing service and our DES partners. And, and uh, we, are, we are very, very fortunate now that we have that kind of framework to build off of. Um, and I, I think that, um, you know, I think as we move forward, um, I, I'm, I'm going to talk about you like you're not sitting there for a second. Um, <laughs> but I, I've been really pleased with um, how, how quickly the new director has hit the ground and like, you know, uh, really engaged with what it is we've got going. And she's made sure she knows what we need and she's busted her tail to get it to us and work with us, not around us. Um, and that kind of vibe, I think, is, is a thing that we really, really needed. And I think now is a really good time for it to head. So Great. I have high hopes. That's good news. All right, are there any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you very yes, much. Sir. Pleasure. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. All right, next on the agenda is the emergency services report. Uh, Gary, if I could interrupt for just a second. Yes, I don't sir. remember if we acknowledge you know, the I fact that Dr. Martin is, <laughs> no. is on with us we this didn't. evening. Would you mind? <laughs> um, so Dr. Janelle Martin is on with us remotely. She is um, covering for um, our medical director while he recovers after, after the crash that he was involved in. Um, she is the Region 1 EMS uh, uh, Regional Medical Director, um, and she's been... Um, really awesome and a, and, a, and a good partner for us um, while we've been working through some of the stuff in Dr. Finkelstein's absence. So thank you for being with us, ma'am. 
Thank you so much for the invitation. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I know that I am incredibly new, um, so I appreciate your tolerance in that as we yeah, bridge the gap until Dr. Finkelstein can be back with you all. But please reach out at any time. Your individuals there have my contact information, and I'm happy to help in any way. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, emergency services report. All right. Well, good evening. Um, and uh, so first, I don't have a, a full report. Obviously, I think I have eight days in the chair. Um, <laughs> but I do want to thank uh, the county administrator, uh, Mr. Weiskopf, and the county commissioners, and, and certainly uh, many of you uh, for your confidence in me. Um, so I have arrived, as Sean said, <laughs> um, and, 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 and as I would, uh, and trying to take everything in, learn as quickly as possible, but with due regard, right? There's a lot to learn about a new system um, and managing relationships. And so I really thank each and every one of you um, for extending the warm welcome and being so accommodating. And I, and I sincerely look forward to working with everyone here in St. Mary's County. Uh, my batteries are charged and I'm energized and I think the staff uh, feels my presence every morning hmm. as I walk in the door. I really want to thank, and I'm sorry Gerald walked out, but, but both of the deputy directors, uh, Kirsten Shea and Gerald Gardner, um, Sean stole a little bit of my fire here this evening, <laughs> um, but both of them for their steadfast commitment and devotion to emergency services and everything they've been doing here on the ground uh, for a little over a year as they've searched for the director. Um, they've been very welcoming and accommodating as well. And I want to thank you and know that the work you've been doing and will continue to do and the three of us moving forward um, is going to be good work. Um, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I know the community thanks you as well. Um, it does not go unnoticed. So uh, incredible, incredible people at work here. Um, so just real quick, you know, I come here uh, with some 32 years experience. I got my start too in the volunteer system in a little place called Carroll County uh, and then was fortunate enough to work a career for 24 years in Baltimore County. So uh, a diverse portfolio uh, of experience, professional experience that brings me here. And I am, again, just very grateful for the opportunity to serve uh, alongside uh, with each and every one of you. Um, and there is uh, good work being done here in St. Mary's County and we'll continue again to do that, that good work. Um, you know, the sort of the, the foundation that's been built here and, and the way we'll continue forward um, is first and foremost, right, is the reason we're all here, um, is the commitment to public safety and public service. Uh, each and every one of us sitting up here and in the room, that is, that's our calling, is public service and public safety. And we'll maintain that commitment, that customer service, community relations, all the things that, you know, that the whole reason that we are here, and that is to serve. And I uh, just want to reinforce and my commitment to each and every one of you. Uh, relationship management is, uh, is uh, priority one. And I think the deputies have done a nice job, as you said, Sean, of establishing that relationship and is my intent to continue building that relationship. Um, and so I look forward, I know I have some meetings coming up with everyone, uh, getting around the county, meeting the volunteers and the volunteer fire companies and rescue squads. Uh, like I said, give me a number, not uh, a name, not a number, because I won't recognize them right away. Um, but I will learn um, as, as quickly as I can. Um, but but uh, thanks everyone for the warm welcome here in St. Mary's County. I'm making my roots here in Leonardtown and finding it a very lovely place to live. So that's all I have for the report. I'll give you some more, some more in two months when we have some more to share. Uh, the budget, did you want to move into that? or? Yeah, I think, uh, and, and Deputy Director Shea is here with me, but I will uh, try to get through this. Uh, so the FY25 uh, budget, um, you can go to the next slide, ma'am. And Kirsten will back me up here. She's, I got my training wheels on here this evening. Right. So um, there were some positions uh, recommended um, and for the FY25 budget, uh, which are the two uh, medical duty officers for EMS um, to expand uh, the current span of control for our EMS personnel. Next slide. 
Uh, there was recommendation for a differential increase for night differential for EMS and communications division personnel. Those are folks who work the 24 seven, 24 hour day schedules. Next slide, please. Uh, there was recommendations for equipment form submissions. Uh, there was a recommendation to support 100 of the XL 400 portable radios uh, for the fire departments. Um, the 90 pagers were not recommended in the FY25 budget. Next slide, please. And recommendation uh, to support the replacement of the microwave system, the failed PM radios and the spares and the additional dispatch radios uh, all are recommended in the FY25 budget. And that's, so, um, so as we proceed through the budget process, again, I'm new, so the deputies are helping me along, but we do have the appeals uh, that if we have any appeals within our budget, uh, we must submit those by the 24th of April. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, have any questions? So right now, what we've recommended is has been approved by the so pending it's been the recommended by the commissioners and county administration and still has to go to public right, hearing yeah. appeals and then the final budget will be approved at the end of may so right now we're good unless something changes through the everything's recommended at this right. point okay. besides the pagers in one of our early draft wasn't wasn't there some communication center staff in one of the early iterations of this? In the position request, we requested four call taker positions. It was not recommended. So out of the positions, we had four call takers, an emergency planner, a fiscal manager for EMS, and four MDOs. What's recommended is the two MDOs. Okay. I just, I know that there's been some significant concern about the workload for our 911 personnel and the need in for the a call room. taker, a dedicated call taker. And I think we even highlighted that in this this meeting last time we talked about this, that how important those positions were to hopefully keep in there. And Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I would defer to, to your judgment on this, but I, I think that that might be something that's worth keeping an eye on bandwidth and seeing if we can get something like that back in in appeals. Okay. I just I I know very well um, I'm not a dispatcher largely because I would never in a million years have the patience to do that um, I understand the the stress that they are under and the amount of work that they are doing in the room um, and especially when we have high volume periods absolutely the, the call volume uh, the QA program that we launched back in January is really identifying the need for the dispatcher to be able to focus solely on the call while somebody else is dispatching and processing. So at least right now, I think we have everybody's attention as far as the needs and the QA program as we have more data for that that will help to support the need for the positions. I know that it's a very difficult budget year. Yeah. Um, many, I don't know, Gerald, if you know right off the top of your head how many positions were approved for new positions in county government. It, not many it's very few yeah so it's, I, I it, it strikes me as a significant safety issue you know I I want to know when when I am on apparatus I want to know that there's somebody that will add that is dedicated to paying attention to me yep. and if that means that we need somebody who's dedicated to paying attention to the phone so Correct. that that they're not Correct. distracted by the phone call for you know another 911 right right, right? absolutely it's not that they're, it's not that they're you know, chatting with Sarah on the party line, it's there. You gotta love an Andy Griffith show reference. Um, <laughs> there's, it's, it's legit. They're, they're doing stuff. It's yeah, not absolutely. like they're. I mean, any, any accident rush hour time on 235, the phones are consumed. We have five to six people in the room at a time and they're on the phones and there's still other emergency calls going on at the time. There's other police communication going on. I mean, there's absolutely a need for the call taker position. We're just trying to build the data and the support to help justify it. Sure. So just so I'm clear, um, because this is my first budget iteration I am coming in, your the request was for four call takers, call takers separate from dispatchers. Correct. So currently the call takers and the dispatchers serve the same function in fire and EMS. Dispatchers do the call taking. Okay, understood. And another goal of that was that it would be an, an additional career ladder. Understood. Introductory. Right, like an ECT1, ECT2. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, understood. Thank you. 
to answer your question, if I remember correctly, there was one person in Parks and Rec uh, suggested there was one reclass for DPNW and and then the two MDOs I asked for four, I got two. That was all that was approved in the recommended budget to take the hearing. I, I'm not mad about him giving us something. <laughs> I'm just recognizing that that the opportunity cost of what we're getting is still a significant need, and I think we need to highlight that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Understood. And we do, just for your purposes, we do have a meeting uh, scheduled, the three of us, um, and Marianne to discuss uh, our upcoming budget. So, uh, again, one of those things, uh, fast and furious, that we're working on getting up to speed on. So I've heard your concerns. I appreciate your feedback. The Maybe. only uh, other question I had, the, the pagers, I know that's been a work in progress and trying to make sure every, all of them are accounted for. Do we know uh, how many we have available uh, for those departments that do need them for new personnel? As far as remaining inventory? Correct very limited okay very limited is there any opportunity to you know i know this was just a uh, strike through to look at lowering that number maybe you know looking at 30 or looking at 40 um versus just striking the whole 90 because i do there are departments that do have a need for pagers because they're just out of them completely um i'm sure it's something that we can revisit okay. with county admin as far as that goes i know part of the process of us trying to do um, a full inventory and get IT has worked with us to of help course, build an yeah. inventory so we can really identify where some of those assets are and um, I know some of the EMS companies do have some spares we've reached out to them as well as far as potentially shifting some around mm -hmm. um, to try to spread the wealth where they're needed essentially um, but yeah we can certainly revisit that with appeals I guess our understanding is that they've been fairly responsive yeah. correct I, Just I guess our, our thing would be is if any get freed up during the inventory process and the, and the reprogramming, Yep. We, we definitely need them in the fire stations. Okay. Yeah. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, CAD update. Okay. Um, just a brief update on CAD. So again, um, <laughs> Hit the seat last week, uh, had uh, some correspondence and communication with um, our volunteer partners and also internal um, and had a meeting. Um, so basically um, our confidence level of go live for 4.30 uh, had diminished uh, greatly. Um, so uh, some of the testing was conducted uh, and we were not 100% prepared to go live on April 30th. Uh, so I did meet with uh, the director of IT and members of county administration had a discussion and we are uh, we're going to continue uh, the training and, pre and preparing all the volunteer companies, fire companies and rescue squads to to prepare for go live. But the new go live date is August 12th. Um, the vendor Tyler Technologies is working with us, uh, the developers and engineers uh, to resolve some of the problems that we believe we found in the testing background in the in the sandbox we're working in. And as of I think Friday afternoon, um, Deputy Director Shea and her team uh, met with Tyler again, um, and we're making some some better progress um, in some of the. We found some uh, potential flaws in the logic, uh, causing some of the issues that we were experiencing. Um, so we are making much better progress now. Uh, August twelfth is our absolute go live. That's you know that's our that's our end goal. Uh, that's the goalpost. So we're going to continue getting the companies prepared for the transition. Uh, get the training done, rolled out, and uh, have ample time to get everybody prepared for the transition. Uh, meaning everybody, meaning DES, meaning the volunteers, uh, squads, the rescue squads, the firefighters, and uh, all of our dispatch, you know, uh, call takers, dispatchers. So, uh, again, appreciate, um, you know, you reaching out, the open communication, and the communication is key. Uh, and, you know, uh, so we are, we don't want to go live until we're ready to go live, you know, the, the, the safety of, of the public and the first responders is is paramount, right? That's our focus. Um, and so we identified a problem, talked to the vendor, and so we're pushing back to August. But that is our that is our new firm go live. And so uh, we do appreciate, I know everybody, uh, all of our partners here tonight, everyone's working 
um, feverishly, not feverishly, but you know, very dedicated, some feverishly, um, to really help us do this testing. And so we thank you again for the partnership um, to make this go alive in August. What, are, what do we think are the odds that we might actually get um, a, 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 an opportunity for a give and take with the project manager at our meeting in June? Um, it's, it's the last one we'll have before the drop dead for the go live goes. And I, I think that it would be beneficial for us to have, to be able to have that exchange with, you know, the, our representative from the county that's been interacting with Tyler and close all those loops. Um, do we think that's feasible? You meaning what, I mean, what are you looking for from the project um, well, manager? We, um, Um, the, one of the things that I think that we have struggled with in this process, um, has been, um, the speaking of communication and, and improving communication. Um, you know, we've had really good communication with our DES partners. I think that there's been, um, a little bit less robust communication with our IT partners about where we are you know, in the process and, and, you know, what's, what they're seeing. Um, and so, you know, it, it's like, and, and I, I think last meeting I said this to, to Shay while we were talking about it, um, the, the, you don't have all of the answers for the what's up with this questions that, that are coming up and it's not fair for us to expect you to have those when there's a project manager who should. So I just, I think that it would, um, that it would benefit us generically to, to be able to have like, uh, here we go. We're almost at the end of this thing, kind of a, kind of a brief from the project manager about what this thing looks like. That is a complete overhaul of the way we do business before we're finally at jump off the edge. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I mean, if I'm the only one who thinks that way, that's I'm cool, but I just think that would benefit us. Yeah. Let's say let's, let's. At least extend the invitation. Right, of course, uh, and, and I hear I hear that, and I, and I think there's you know some util utility there as well. Let's uh, let's work through the next couple of weeks and see the progress we make uh, internally. Right? Um, yes, this is a, you know CAD support is an IT supported project, um, but I think the the majority of the work being done right now is we are you are we are yeah. the end users, right? And so. This is what's important now, and, and Shay and her team know exactly, you know, what the problems are as you guys are discovering them in real time, and so I think the the coordination and the collaboration is there. Um, but let's see where we go in the next couple of weeks about resolving this and getting us where we need to be and get your questions answered. Um, and then if if there's still a desire, um, certainly you know we'll see if we can facilitate that request. Is that I'm fair? Thank you. Any other questions? The only thing, and, and I, I meant to talk to you about this before the meeting, uh, Kirsten, but the emergency networking, we're, everyone's setting that up. We're able to put calls in currently. We can, we can start using that. Can we, if a department decides they want to exclusively start using that, is that ready at this point, or are we working through some, anything with that? So if a, if a company has a contract that ends June 1st or whatever it is with the current software they're using, is emergency networking Capable. going to be in the position where we can actually start using it? So I would have, have to, have a CAD link. I understand. I that. would have to go back and um, inquire some more. I don't know if we're looking at the old CAD to set up some direct feeds, or if it would be more of a manual entry. Like you've built your personnel in, you've you've built it that way. I'm not sure that they would set up the old CAD to have the feed into emergency networking. But we can certainly ask and get that information. Yeah, and because we've talked about it, I mean, we're, everyone's kind of on like a month to month or a six month extension for what they're using and those that are planning to convert over, we just want to make sure it's seamless. Yeah, so. I can ask that tomorrow and have some follow up and get back to you guys on that. Yep. Thanks. Everything was good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving along, the uh, cadet program, Kelly. Good evening.
So for our cadet program, um, our fire students um, have uh, completed fire one, fire two, hazmat, engine ops. Um, they are currently completing truck ops. And after that class is completed, um, they will be moving into ARF. So I think this year, it's been a wonderful year for the fire students, um, and it'll really um, provide them with a lot of opportunities for moving to career departments after graduation. Um, for our EMT students, um, they are working uh, through Mod 3 right now, um, and they had 13 out of the 14 students pass Mod 2. Sweet. So I, I think that's wonderful. It's really good. And, um, I know, Sean, you know, that's... Um, you are a subject matter expert with EMT, <laughs> so I, 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 uh, I think the students have done very well with, with that. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Also, I had nothing to do with that. Don't look at me like that. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're trying to give me credit for Jody's good work, but it's that's a that's a really good yeah, success. Awesome. Right. That's a that's a that's a really really good success rate. Right? Yeah. Yeah. We're very excited about that, and it shows the application of the students too. Yeah. Oh, absolutely! Yep. Yeah. I, all the students are very dedicated, um, and you know, want to be there every day. They're showing up, and it's clear by these numbers, very clear. So, I've interacted with a couple on calls too, so, so they're doing well. Um, and and registration is um, going on right now for next year's program, and. Uh, Jody believes we will have, um, you know, higher numbers um, for both EMT and fire next school year, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, you know, she has 14 students this school year for EMT and 10 for fire. So both very solid classes. Yeah. You know, it'd be nice to see that increase for fire enrollment, um, which I believe we'll be seeing. Any questions regarding mm -hmm. the cadet program? Yeah, on the fire, uh, you mentioned fire one, fire two. They've all successfully uh, completed all of that? No, sir. Okay. No, they've not all successfully completed. Um, we did have, so uh, out of the 10, there were several students who had already completed fire one. So those students were not required to right. retake fire one. Um, so my understanding is that we did have one student who participated in Fire One and did not successfully complete, um, but we did have seven take it. So six out of the seven. Um, and then um, out of those, we, uh, it says nine um, took the hazmat, seven passed. Um, fire two, eight took fire two, and all passed. And including Jody, um, in an effort to work towards her fire instructor certification, she as well passed fire two, which cool. is Good. which is great. Um, so that'll that'll really open it up for um, instructors. Um, and even though they didn't pass, they can still retake, correct? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, they they got absolutely. time to retake it, so right. And still, you know, it is, you know, as you all know, you know, they're, all the information they gain the first time around, they can use it, you know, so the second time around, they will pass. Um, any other questions? Yeah, what's ARF? Airport it's, Rescue um, Firefighter. Yeah. It's a new one on me. I just <laughs> airport, airport rescue firefighter. And it is a required uh, certification to work for NDW if you're at Pax River. Makes sense. And, yeah. and several other um, locations, I'm certain. Possible airport. So yeah. it's yeah. very important to have that if you're looking um, to it's be hired by NDW. It is a shoe in. Yeah. Hmm. Cool. I'm glad we were able to get them that. And I think this is the first year um, that we've been able to arrange that. And I know Jody right. has really been been pushing that, and that's all credit to Jody Truesdale for that. It's great. Sweet. All right. Sweet. All right. Uh, next is uh, Dependent Care Reimbursement Program. Yes, sir. So the Dependent Care Reimbursement Program, um, it began uh, back in 2017, if you can remember, Look that far back, uh, we did uh, survey our volunteers um, regarding their need 
or if there was even a need for um, dependent care assistance. Um, Jessica Myers, um, at that time, she was the chief of Mechanicsville Volunteer Rescue Squad, and, and she really saw the need within her own department. Um, we put out that survey. We had 113 respondents. Um, and out of those respondents, 43 indicated that the, the cost of dependent care negative, negatively impacted um, the amount of time that they were able to volunteer. So, um, you know, working with leadership across fire EMS, um, that time it was the emergency services committee and transition to the board. Um, and then we were able to take this to the commissioners and they were uh, very receptive to this idea. They did, um, you know, very graciously uh, found $22,000 within um, the budget to fund this. Um, and since, you know, um, this has been a wonderful program that, that we've been able to assist volunteers with. Um, we would like to move forward with some uh, proposed changes to this program. Um, and I know in your documents, um, the board docs did provide you with all of these uh, proposals. Um, and the proposed changes, we uh, would like to do these um, to ensure there is enough funding for all volunteers who are interested in participating um, to be able to participate. Um, we want to make sure funding can extend as much as possible. Um, so for instance, right now we do not have a uh, monthly cap on dependent care reimbursement, um, but we are proposing a $500 maximum um, each month. And working with our partners in Calvert County, they have had a, uh, a $500 maximum limit as well um, there. Any questions about these proposed changes? And there's been no changes, correct, since uh, 2017 is what you're saying? Correct. And the program, um, it did uh, start officially um, September 11th of 2018 is when the commissioners approved the program. But um, we did have one update that the commissioners offered us for an increase in the reimbursement rate, um, but that is the only change we have had since the start of the program. Because it was like eight to, it was, it was the move to 10 is what that was. Correct, it was the $10 per hour per dependent. So when we initially started the program, we framed it, um, much like Calvert County's program, but of course, you know, we, you know, we had some differences to make it unique and to fit our uh, framework a little bit better. But initially, it was a minimum of five hours uh, of staffing would uh, make the, the volunteer eligible for $30 per child for reimbursement. As we all know, I mean, five hours and you know thirty dollars of reimbursement that's i mean that's a drop in the bucket so um there was you know of course a, a lack of participation by volunteers and and after discussion it was well why you know do all this paperwork um when really it, it's really not helping us at all so that is when um you know, the commissioners were very agreeable, very generous, again, with increasing um, the reimbursement rate to $10 per hour per dependent. Um, the, the only thing that I want to put on your radar about this, I don't think it's a thing that, like, scuttles us at all or anything right now, um, but I think that... Um, the the length and involvement of an EMT class for a working adult uh, is a significant thing 
and and right. I would be willing to bet that there are folks who can't get through an EMT class because childcare is an issue for them during the course of class. <laughs> um, and so I, I think that, that maybe something that we look at funding dependent in the future might be including those initial certification things. I don't think it would be out of line to do it for fire courses either, but right. I'm much more intimately acquainted with the 212 hours that it takes to become an EMT in the evening and on the weekend. Absolutely. So, you know, the, those, those, those prime do things with your kid times. Right. Um, so I think that, that looking at that in future would be a good thing just to have on your radar. No, and much appreciated. I think that is something that we should um, definitely keep yeah. on the radar. Well, because the line has the line has to be in the sand someplace, mm -hmm. and I think what's here is reasonable. Well, I, know, I remember though at the RSA meeting when we discussed this thing, there was a major concern about not being eligible to participate by a Zoom and get oh, okay. funding. So I, I see it's still in here that virtual is not. It is. Fundable. It is, and. And that is, um, you know, a, a concern that was communicated. Um, and I know uh, with Deputy Director Shea, you know, and absolutely, um, you know, it is tough um, because there's only so much funding, mm -hmm. of course. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, just trying to find that fine balance and... Um, we just want to ensure there is funding available for everyone interested. I, mean, uh, I, I look at it like this. If, if, you, if I'm going to pay you to have a babysitter, then come into the meeting. You know, not, why do I got to pay you to be a babysitter to sit at home behind your computer screen? It's not unfair. But I, mean, that, I mean, that's my personal opinion. I mean, I know I'll probably piss people off in, in the RSA, but, you know, my personal opinion on Zoom meetings, they were great during COVID, but we need to get back into the room, you know, because I – feel we accomplish a lot more business in person than we do via the, the And if this is screen. one benefit that causes people to come back, then that's even that's, better. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you. Like, and if we get to a point where, you know, Zoom is the, the norm again in any fashion, then maybe we can reevaluate. But I, I think I think the changes are much needed to sustain the program. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I don't I don't disagree with the changes. And, I, and I'm, I'm not willing to die on the hill of of like neither am I. I, mean, I, will, I, I just I, wanted I to mention. I disagree with you about the availability of Zoom, though. I, it, one of the one of the things that I think is really important is that we are doing everything that we can to encourage people to participate in whatever way they can, and and every time we put up a barrier to somebody volunteering their time while we're talking, making all of this noise about trying to encourage volunteer service, I, we're it's self defeating in my opinion. So, uh, which is which is why I I will continue to advocate for having that available for people as they need it. I don't think it's you know uh, it, it's it's not feasible all the time. Certainly, it's I, I carry myself down to the station in the park for my regular meetings, and when I don't have class on Mondays, I show up at my meetings out in Seventh District because that's what I do, you know. Um, but you know, it, it's we we do all of our chiefs meetings virtually because it is more convenient for um, the the people in that that I need to be in that meeting and available to do it that way. And so I just, I, again, if it's, if it is um, making it easier for people to give us their time, that's a gift I think we shouldn't be looking in the mouth. And, and I don't disagree with the fact that the, there's a benefit to that, but also having that benefit and having that incentive or whatever you want to call it, Zoom, and then getting paid for that, I think is a little different. Uh, yes, I agree. You can still have Zoom as an option, they just won't get rid of it. Yeah. And what is the current budget for uh, recommendation for 25? Uh, 22,000. Okay. Thanks. And right now we do have uh, several newer volunteers, especially to the EMS system. And, and much to, to Sean's point is all of these new uh, EMS volunteers are very interested in participating in the next EMT class. So, um, you know, I, I think this will be a huge benefit, um, but of course, it, we want to make sure there is plenty of funding for these additional uh, volunteers to utilize the program as well. I'm good with it. Do we need 
Please. action from us, Kelly? Yes. We would like to go ahead and, and request your support. We would like to um, move forward with um, taking these proposed changes to the commissioners um, because this will, will require their uh, final approval. And we're not, we're looking at implementing these changes July 1st. Sure. The new fiscal year. After so, the fiscal year. Yes, sir. So um, we will continue, of course, with our, our current um, policies. Um, I think this year we're, we're going to be able to, to slide in. Um, and uh, in any case, I, I think we'll be fine for the rest of this fiscal year. But of course, like I said, those um, additional uh, volunteers who have expressed great interest um, in utilizing the program um, I believe it'll it'll work out for next fiscal year. All right, so I'll make a motion that we uh, draft a letter of support for the dependent care reimbursement program changes. I'll second that. I have a motion by J.A., second by Ken. Questions on the motion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. All right, uh, last on our agenda is EMS billing that CP. Oh, yeah. Um, should be real quick. Um, we have uh, currently several uh, incidents uh, while performing duties as a volunteer fire department personnel or DES staff and EMS and volunteer EMS. Uh, if they uh, sustain an injury or illness while uh, performing their duties, they're uh, being they're transported by EMS. Uh, they're receiving a uh, EMS transport bill. Um, I'm requesting uh, this board here, Mercy Services Board, uh, uh, write a letter of endorsement to the uh, county commissioners uh, asking them to uh, please uh, exempt all fire, uh, EMS, and DES employees should they uh, perform an illness or injury while performing their duties on the job and they're transported that uh, they be exempt from uh, receiving an EMS transport bill. Uh, so, Just one question, does, does that include our brothers at uh, NDWS? I don't think uh, that's a discussion uh, we would have to have with. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I mean, throw they're, that they're out. coming out and running our call. I wouldn't throw that out the window, but I think we would us. have to ask those questions to them. I, I think they're covered by on the job anyway. Oh, if something was to happen, I'm not. Well, being, I'm just, being I'm there, just they're, curious they're because it, it's no, no. They're they're covered by being on. on the well, job. I mean, I, well, our I, workers' I, comp should cover us also. I would yeah. assume. I mean, if you're if you're yeah, technically the squads, it is the the, the 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 we were still getting bills though. Yeah. 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 I guess the question being. If a DES person is transported, are they getting a bill? <laughs> That's what I was going to ask. I mean, is the county billing, billing yourself? <laughs> okay. if, if, yeah. the, if, the, if the name goes on the report, it goes through the system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> report is filled out correctly. They are getting a bill. But that St. Was, Mary's County is getting a bill. I mean, because it's under the workers' comp. So if they are hurt on the job it, and it's work-related, correct? then it goes to workman's comp. If Gerald has an issue and is transported while at work to the hospital, they would bill my insurance company. So there's a little difference between workman's comp and yeah, sure. somebody getting hurt, like okay, having okay. chest pains. That makes sense. Well, and that's the that's the split the hair between illness and injury. Yeah. Correct. The other thing you have to remember is. I mentioned earlier about meeting with the hospital. That's going to help tremendously getting information. So there will not be a potential bill go there. But if the insurance company, if you did get a bill, the commissioners from the very, very beginning, and Sean, you were involved in this, is soft billing. So if Gerald got a bill and my insurance company didn't pay for it and I don't pay for it, we don't go after Gerald. Well, and one of the things that, that we've worked on is the is the language about communicating that. And I, I think one of the one of the things that 
has kind of languished on our collective list of things to do just <laughs> because none of us has anything going on um, is is looking at um, some public outreach that's some better explanations about what we're had doing a very good going. meeting the um, probably the day or the day after you and I talk CP um, it's already been developed we just need to get some other people to look at it so EMS providers can give patients right so not necessarily firemen that are hurt on at a scene but give patients or family information and phone number where if they get a bill this is why we're billing this is where it goes it's off billing if you have questions here you can email or call this number that was one the other one we looked at there's a couple bills a lot of times people get bills and they're not bills they're statements that says your insurance company was charged let's rephrase that the insurance company was billed a thousand dollars and they paid 750 and so that it's basically a statement so it's not necessarily a bill so we're working on how do we distinguish and maybe instead of there being another coming out say well you owe 250 right because the insurance company paid 750 was a thousand now you're getting a statement an invoice bill for 250 again you don't pay it it goes away and we have a write-off policy um, after so many days it's automatically written off and we've already discussed with the billing company on how we can better define those documents that are going out and possibly adding some information that Sean and I discussed on them, right? There's no place that says who to call, Yeah. right? So sometimes a phone call would, hey, I got this, what is it? Oh, that's just showing you that we were billed $1,000 and your insurance company paid $1,000. I just think it's, uh, that has nothing to do with what you're discussing. I'm just talking in general about the fire. The no, building. no, no. And, I, and I'm just trying to, I think the least thing someone should have to worry about if they're incapacitated from getting uh, injured or, or what, whatnot while performing on the job of helping the citizens of St. Mary's County is, is a EMS yeah. bill. I think that's a no brainer. I mean, I don't, I don't, I, it's, Odd we're even having this conversation. To be quite honest. I mean, yeah, I, I'm well, with you. I just think it's something we. I'm I'm asking this board just to hey write a write a letter to the county commissioners, just asking yeah. for fire EMS and and DS employees to be. Well, and from it. honestly, consensus at at Amos Association last week was was Same. okay, cool, whatever. <laughs> Um, you know, it, it's uh, because again, it's from from our perspective, it's it's a soft bill, so it's not necessarily something that we're expecting, right? Um, and for the, the proportions that we're talking about, it's not going to be a make it or break it amount of money that we're talking about for us as a system, no. but it is, it, it is something that could be a make it or break it issue for an individual in that sort of a circumstance. <clears throat> so, I mean, I'm, I'm all about finding a way to make it happen. I, I think that, that if nothing else, it is a, um, it is a valuable gesture to the people who we are. Again, we're asking you to volunteer your time. The least we can do is support you in every way we can as part of that process correct all right with that is there you want is there a motion or is there any action yeah i i i make a motion that we have the esb draft a letter to the uh county commissioner of st mary's county to request des fire and ems personnel who may uh, encounter illness or injury while performing duties be exempted from ems transport bill second all right we have a motion by cp second by ja is there any questions on the motion all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Any board member? Hattie, anything board member time? No, sir. Jay? No. CP? I just have uh, Director Utz uh, welcome aboard. Uh, we're here to support you any way we can in fire. Please let us know if you need anything. And uh, Deputy Director Shea and Deputy Director Gardner, thank you all and the entire DES staff for uh, holding the uh, holding down the fort uh, until the director got here. And uh, thank you all very much for everything you've done. Thank and you, CP. look forward to working mm -hmm. a thank great you. partnership. And, and likewise, thank you so much. John? You heard me talk enough. <laughs> 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 director Ots, you have anything? 
No, just, again, pleasure to be here, pleasure to serve, and looking forward to working with everybody. And thanks, Dr. Martin, for being oh. online uh, this evening and for stepping in to help us out. We look forward to working with you as well and for your support here in St. Mary's County. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Ken? Nothing. All right, with that, um, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion. Second. All right, there's a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Hey, Gerald.